buyers who may not have high financial capability, minority sellers complain that they are often forced to sell at lower prices. However, on the flip side, Chinese buyers of public housing flats are forced to pay more for the purchase, for their purchase, because of the larger competitive pool of Chinese buyers. It is precisely this recognition of the power of oppression created by privilege for not just the privileged, for not just the disprivileged, but also the privileged that can push forward social justice efforts to achieve equality, justice, and genuine racial harmony for all. I would like to close with a few words that a friend had posted on a Facebook page earlier today, which was probably written by a Native American woman, which resonates well with what I have discussed here. It says, privilege is in the presence of perks and benefits. It's the absence of obstacles and barriers. That's a lot harder to notice. If you have a hard time recognizing your privileges, focus on what you don't have to go through. Let that fuel your empathy and action. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saroja Dure Raju, for this very, um, very much illuminating talk on a subject that I think most of us in this room have been thinking about for a while, have lived, experienced, and are hoping to sort of uh, respond to in our own ways. And we, I think we have been in many ways. Thank you for uh, thinking about this using concepts, key concepts, providing some sort of structure so that we can better locate our thoughts so that we can also expand on them and think about them more deeply. Uh, I have a question that uh, Ian Chong had shared with me in the chat box. Um, I could give them the option of uh, reading the question out to you, or I could do that. Ian Chong, would you like to unmute yourself and read the question? If so, please go ahead. Otherwise, I will read your question out for you. Yes, okay, so I, I can read that. So the question is, does meritocracy in Singapore reinforce Chinese privilege and not just make the latter invisible? Might structural disadvantages that set minorities back be attributed to ability, enterprise, or diligence such that Chinese privilege not only gets obscured, but further exacerbated? Okay, Praveen, can you share it on the chat? Um, of course, with yes, me? So, I will do that. It's a rather long question, yeah, so it is, it is. thank you. Meanwhile, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to share them once uh, Professor Dure Raju is finished answering this question. Otherwise, of course, uh, unmute yourselves to do so. Hang on. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, I'll, um, there are two parts to this question, so let me take uh, them in parts. Yeah, does meritocracy in Singapore reinforce Chinese privilege and um, not just make the letter invisible? I think it's both, right? Because um, meritocracy, um, because <clears throat> um, what I'm arguing is that it's precisely the discourse of meritocracy, right? When we say, um, you know, people have achieved uh, or people have arrived, people have become successful um, because of, um, on their own merit, rather than because they had some privileges, some advantages, they did not start on equal, you know, there was no equal playing field. Um, that kind of argument um, kind of fails in Singapore. So in a sense, by saying that, what um, meritocracy does is that it actually, um, reinforces, um, it, it actually um, not just makes uh, privilege invisible, but it reinforces Chinese privilege. I think it's a dialectical thing that is going on here, right? 
um, it might be a little bit difficult to fathom it, but I mean, if you look at it at the um, uh, theoretical level, you can both invisibilize um, privilege, but also um, reinforce it through the idea of meritocracy, basically because uh, privilege is invisibilized. Because privilege is invisibilized, it can, um, it can act to reinforce uh, privilege. I don't know if I, uh, what I'm saying makes sense, but I'm trying to understand it um, in a conceptual manner. I'm just trying to use words which will help me to conceptualize it in that way. Precisely because it is not visible, it becomes stronger. It has more power. It gains power precisely because it is not um, it is um, not visible. Yeah. So that's my answer to your first question. My structural disadvantages that set uh, minorities back be attributed to ability, enterprise, or diligence, uh, such that uh, Chinese privilege not only gets um, obscured, but further exacerbated. I think this, again, uh, relates to the first part of what I said, right? Because again, when um, minorities um, find themselves, um, um, you know, not performing uh, well, it is often attributed to the lack of ability, to the lack of enterprise, and to the lack of diligence, right? So we have an entire, um, the government used to operate on a huge kind of uh, cultural rhetoric regarding the Malay community, where they said the Malay community in Singapore had what they called a cultural deficit, right? The cultural deficit thesis was very much used to define the Malay community. What do we mean by cultural deficit? That means Malay culture was not inherently in tune to, uh, for economic development kind of idea. So this was constantly and consistently used as an argument um, for a long time, um, at least until the 2000s to um, uh, depict and define the Malay community to say why the Malay community is not doing well, why the Malay community is falling behind in Singapore's, you know, highly um, um, mobile um, kind of, um, you know, economic progress uh, system uh, was, um, was what was uh, constantly present. Now, by doing that, you Again, you not only uh, you further exacerbate uh, Chinese privilege. Why? Because the Malay community is not doing well because it's of their own uh, own doing. If they are not doing well, right? Minorities are no. If they are not doing well, it's of their own uh, doing. When you keep saying that you just continue to not just obscure um, Chinese privilege, not just in, uh, invisibilize Chinese privilege, but further exacerbate it because people can go on to claim that they are highly successful because they are hardworking without, um, you know, while at the same time enjoying the privileges which have been invisibilized. So that's my answer to this question. Thank you. Um, there's another question by Timothy Lowe in the chat box. He shared that with everyone. Uh, would you like to address that question? Uh, okay, let me see. Um, this function is a little bit hard for me to I'm equally address. Uh, it's, um, the question is, can you discuss some of the ways in which Chinese privilege in Singapore manifests differently from white privilege in the US? And okay. There are a few parts to the question. Maybe you can uh, begin with this and then I could read the other parts. Or should I read them all together? Yes, please. Yeah, and it goes on to say, and I think in some ways this lecture preaches to the choir. How can we talk to Singaporeans resistant to this idea? And in a bracket, uh, they say, I have struggled a bunch with this example, friends asking, do SAP schools make that much of a difference? Okay, uh, thank you for that question, actually. What are the ways uh, in which uh, Chinese privilege uh, manifests itself uh, differently from white privilege in the US, right? Um, well, um, you know, um, the concept of Chinese privilege, many, uh, uh, several scholars, as I um, showed just now, including um, Daniel Go and um, Terence Chong, right, have uh, argued that, um, the concept of Chinese privilege seems to be a transposition of white privilege. And um, that is not a good way to do things basically because you know, these two contexts have completely different uh, histories. That's not what we are talking about here when we talk about Chinese privilege as um, you know, deriving from white privilege. What we, are say, what we are focusing on is the concept of privilege itself. Privilege is something that is unearned, okay? 
and more so it continues to exist because it is not just invisible but made invisible or invisibilized. So um, in that sense, um, how, does, um, how does Chinese privilege then become uh, different from white, uh, white privilege? In, well, <laughs> I think uh, one of the important ways is exactly what's happening in this lecture, right? Why I'm doing this lecture, because in the United States, um, you know, when, when Peggy McIntosh first started this uh, her whole discussion project on white privilege, I've watched a lot of the videos too, you know, her white uh, participants, the students, the white students used to scream at her, used to cry, used to, you know, uh, fight against her uh, kind of claims of white privilege, used to, you know, walk out of the room, do, did not want to um, listen to some of these arguments that were going on. Um, Singaporeans, we are, um, we are less hysterical, I would uh, think, than our American uh, counterparts. So we don't scream and shout, but, um, we constantly use um, social media and even, um, you know, use journals, right, to publish uh, articles to beat down the uh, concept of Chinese privilege without understanding, like I said, um, how privilege itself can be um, oppressive privilege uh, to not just uh, minorities, but to the people uh, who, pos who possess it as well. So in that sense, I, I think you see similarities that not just because Chinese privilege derives from white privilege, but just the concept of privilege itself creates um, both um, creates benefits, but it also creates disadvantages to both groups, I think. That's where I see um, similarities there because I come at it from the perspective of privilege itself. Okay, rather than Chinese or white, I come at it from the perspective of privilege itself. Um, and your question on whether uh, SEP schools make a difference to, let me uh, get to the question again, whether SEP schools, where is the question? Okay, whether SEP schools make uh, that much of a difference. Um, you know, um, I, I don't remember the number of sub schools that we have in Singapore, is it uh, 13? But the amount of funding that they receive, that the sub schools receive from the government is quite disproportionate to the number of, uh, to their numbers, yeah? So the, the funding that they receive is quite, is really quite disproportionate, yeah? So the quest, the, um, the argument becomes like, why should, you know, a particular group of schools and a small group of schools that is be receiving uh, much more funding than even our general national public schools, right? Why should the, so much money be put into such a schools? Do they make that much of a difference? If you look at the backgrounds of the people who um, actually um, graduate from these schools or even the background of some of the politicians, even the backgrounds of some of the uh, top um, office holders in Singapore, you realize that many of them do come from sub schools. So do they make a, a difference? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely, I think, because there is so much of privilege um, founded in these schools that people who actually graduate from these schools actually do go on to make their mark in um, Singapore society. Again, you know, the government changed its rhetoric, right? Uh, first it said, well, it's because we want to encourage those who are really doing well to, um, to uh, you know, have a, a better edu education. This also is a reflection of what the government did, right? In terms of education. Now the government's um, treatment of education in Singapore, if you uh, study it carefully, you'll realize that it's, it's really,